Hello and welcome to everybody to Masterclass Series with Mrs V and my wonderful guest talking all things that we need to know in our life in general. And tonight, very excited to have the gorgeous Julie Hyam Elliott with us. Welcome. Hi, Scarlett. How are you? Yes, hello, good. everyone. Yes, hello. And uh, what we'll, we'll just see if we've got we've got one person. Yes, got a couple joining now, so which is great. Just put the Q and A on. And what we're excited. I mean, I'm so excited because it's it's such a journey, kind of finance. And I think for me personally. Uh, recently i've realized that there really has to be that marriage between every day i've really separated it out but now i have to integrate it more so it's fantastic to talk about a subject that we don't often like to talk about <laughs> so firstly let me just get i'll just get our chat up and running okay so you tell us just a little bit before we get going just tell us a little yep. bit about your background Julie. um so i've um got a very broad financial background from a chartered accounting to uh, lots of different areas across banking and uh, to, to running a bank, sitting on boards, also seeing lots of different businesses and lots of different industries. So it gives me a very unique perspective to be able to actually see how you can create value and business strategy across different areas. Um, so see linkages that people might necessarily see because it's important to be able to see vertically down in an organisation, but I think sometimes you've got to also be able to see linkages across. So definitely I love being able to see linkages across and um, just creating new businesses or growth opportunities out of those, out of those linkages. Because I've also done you know, accounting, banking and financial planning. So I bring all three perspectives together as opposed to just one discipline, which um, is quite rare in the marketplace. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, your experience and being one of the first female general managers, was it, in uh, NAB or what was the... Um... I was the first woman to run a business banking centre um, at the NAB, so it was me and all the boys. Oh, and of the course, boys. For, for, for NAB, that's, uh, you know, very business banking is one of their premier franchises, so, you know, that was massive. But it was great to break new ground and um, I realised through that role the importance of being a role model to other women. So that's what started to really help me develop some of my passion to be that role model and make a difference and help support other women and give them a hand up. And you do, you're actually across a lot of boards as well, aren't you? So you definitely yeah. keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. <laughs> and there's so much going on as I know we'll talk about later. Yeah, awesome. Well, look, firstly, we also wanted to say that there is a bit of a disclaimer, obviously, around finance and financial advice. I understand from my TV days and writing copy <laughs> kind of disclaimers on that level. So we'd like to say that today, that everything that Julie's talking about, I'm, of course, and myself, if I happen to say something, we're all, it's all about, um, you know, you have to seek um, seek advice and before acting on anything here. So definitely anything else you'd like to add to that? No, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Well, look, firstly, tell us, you know, your seven major tips that you've learned. What is your first one? Um, the first one is, you know, really developing a passion for finances. I know it's not the, always seen as the sexiest of topics, but as you said earlier, and I know you've experienced yourself, um, it really is a foundation of life and it has to become integral to everything that you do. Um, so just shying away from it and not engaging and saying, well, when that dread, dreaded F word, I call it the dreaded F word finance is raised, um, you know, women in particular just run away and said, oh, I don't want to know about that. I don't want to deal with that. But you have to know it. You have to have to deal with it. And um, so just engage with your finances and start to learn and grow. So don't just think, oh, I don't know and I can never learn that. Um, you know, common sense gets you a long way, I find, in life. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, trusting your gut um, is really important as well because our guts become finely tuned over the course of our life. Um, so just really start engaging and understanding and um, being inquisitive about finances um, no one's going to have a go at you for, there's no such thing as a dumb question. No one's going to um, say, oh, that was a dumb question. I think people value people that engage and want to learn and grow. And, you know, because I've got some really um, amazing 
girlfriends and you know one of them's who I won't name but it's going through a divorce at the moment and she's you know really high power job really amazing woman and um you know she shared with me confidentially the other week that she's going to struggle to handle their family finances um you know post the divorce and really doesn't know where to start Mm. Um, but really it is just about engaging and growing a passion because it's a fundamental and enabler for life it's funny, it's almost like, and that's a funny comparison, but it's like going to the doctor. Like I've found that so many people, when they walk in and, and see a doctor, they give their power away. And I rem- I've had that happen twice. And I remember it, it's, a, it's a kind of a similar thing with finances that you kind of want someone else to be responsible, but it is giving you power away. So to really, the more you can understand and kind of engage... I love that you talk about that, you know, understanding to really keep your passion around. You might have your passion for work, but keep your passion around your finances, which I'm just doing myself, you know, to kind of integrate together so everyone knows. Cause I, but I think it's also, I think you're absolutely right, but even more than that, like I now go to an integrative doctor for, for wellness so mm-hmm. that I don't go when I get sick, I go to keep well. And I think that same approach to your finances is really important and you know, another tip that I have is, um, you know, choose the right partners, which we'll talk a bit about later as well, but also, you know, trust them, be open and transparent with them um, and share with them. You know, you engage a specialist that knows what they're doing because A, you learn from them, but B, learn from them and be inquisitive, but then trust them to get on, on with their job. But don't, as you say, don't just delegate it completely and leave it totally, totally to them, engage. Beautiful. Love that one. Love that one. Okay. So tip number two. Um, so I get asked a lot, well, how, how do you go about choosing a financier? You know, how do you choose the right person? That's a question I get a lot. And you know, I said earlier about your, your gut feel. So, you know, what I always say is find three people, ask your friends because, you know, friends will have advisors who that they trust and you, you know, you've got friends that are people like you. Um, so ask them for their recommendations, who would they would recommend, and then get three names of either a, a, a financial planner or an accountant or a banker um, and go and meet with those people. And, you know, you're not going to understand all the language they use. If they're using high language that you don't understand, well, they're probably not the right people because mm. they're not talking at the right level. You know, they're more showing off what they know as opposed to, being real and engaging, which I don't always succeed, but I, I try to, I try <laughs> okay. hardest to do yeah. that. But, um, um, and then sit with all three of them and, but then choose the one that you think gets you and what you're trying to achieve the most. And that in your gut is telling you, yes, I think this person gets me and I think I can work with this person. I trust them and I can be open, open and transparent with them. Because, you know, having worked as in financial services for over 25 years, you, know, you see the best and worst of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so many people, you know, occasionally people get into to trouble. And if they'd only come and spoken to you earlier and engaged earlier and told you what was going on, you know, you could have helped them more than, you know, sometimes it gets so far down the track, your hands just get tied a bit. I mean, that's a big thing because of your experience in being banking and so on that other side what is the biggest thing that what or issue that people have had and would you say to do is that one of them is to come in earlier or to get organized earlier or what was the biggest issue for people because you've seen a lot oh uh, i think for businesses it's it's yeah having building that partnership with with your partners and trusting them whether that's your bank or your accountant or or your financial planner and someone that will grow with you as the business grows and expands, but definitely for business, it's cash flow is king. Like profit is really, really important, but you can have profit and without cash flow, um, you, you know your business can still run into trouble. So cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, and, <laughs> and it's king and something that's worthwhile um, working on every day. And there are lots of different options to cash flow issues as well. So. You know, if you're experiencing cash flow problems, talking to people about it early on um, can help find solutions too. And and there's lots of different solutions, which, you know, a lot of people not in the industry mightn't even heard of or know. 
Um, and for an individual, I, I think it's really um, engaging with your finances we, we've, we've spoken about, but also you know, regularly, regularly review them um, yeah. because new products come out. And you know, it's not necessarily just about changing your banks. Um, you know, I always recommend to people go to your existing bank, particularly if they've been good to you, and talk to them about the new products, talk to them about what you've currently got in place. You know, do a bit of hard negotiating with them on the rate first, because it isn't always just about moving. Mm. Um, but then if you know if you can't get what what you want or what you think is in the marketplace, move. Because you know, financial services are moving so fast, there's new products, new features, benefits coming out all the time. I and I mean that goes to, you know, I just did this exercise before Christmas. I set aside a weekend where I reviewed all my insurances because some of the increases were just getting ridiculous that they were trying to put on me. So I sat down and reviewed all my insurances. Some of them I changed, but all of them I got a, a discount on, but some of them and some of them I moved. Um, but I ended up probably saving, you know, between that, my insurances and my electricity, probably saving about $3,000 a year just by spending a weekend um, yeah, and I hadn't. It wasn't an exercise I'd done for three years, so that was something I did myself. It's fantastic, and because I know in the next few weeks you're bringing out your own blog, so you can actually help people because they don't know because things are happening so fast, and who do you trust and what you look for. So it'd be great that you can go into deep dive into that to give advice. So um, that'll be great. Wonderful. So t tell us another tip. Um, so. I would have thought that it's also um, um, knowing, thinking about whether this is an individual or um, um, as a business, knowing your risk tolerance, because we've all, we're all different and we've all um, you know, got different financial situations, but we've also got very different tolerances to risk. Um, risk is something that you face every day in everything that you do so again it's not something you should shy away from but you know if you're someone that you know lies awake worrying at night about investments and all those kind of things well you should go in you know safer investments because you know the old adage risk versus return is very high you know if you if someone's saying they're going to give you a 15 percent return um in today's world um on an investment that's going to come with a fair degree of risk and if you're the kind of person that will lie in bed awake, worrying about, oh my God, am I going to get my money back? Is it is it safe? You know, you should probably shouldn't go into that investment. Um, but some people are happy to take that level of risk. I mean, I've been asked a bit recently, and there's a lot of media been out about, um, you know, the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin being, and we spoke about this earlier today, um, being and Bitcoin being the largest of those. But you know, there's about 300, over 300 cryptocurrencies um, and going into something like a cryptocurrency as an investment, it's a, it's a higher risk. It's really quite speculative. Um, but if you've got a high risk tolerance and you put in money that you are happy to lose, um, it can be a very valid, valid part of a, an investment portfolio. Um, but if, you're, if you don't like that level of risk and you can't afford to speculate and lose money, um, it's something you should go in very warily. I think people should only go into something that they know and understand. Whether it's, it's like property the, market or something like cryptocurrency, never go into something you don't know or understand. Because we had a question earlier, actually, was on Facebook was come through, is was around super funds, your own self-managed super fund, and whether it's a good thing or not, what would you advise? So I think, yeah, it was about... Um, should you have a self-managed super fund? Yeah. yeah. Um, look, absolutely, a self-managed super fund can be very valuable, but I think there's a few things that you need to do. You, you need to have built a reasonable level of awareness because in a self-managed super fund, it's what, it, it's what it's named. You're managing it yourself. So you're making the investments on behalf of the super fund. So you've got to kind of know what your risk tolerance is, as we spoke about, and know... Yeah, you know, what what you're investing in, and there are some restrictions on self-managed super funds as to what they can and can't do. So you need to be across those and understand that as well. Um, you can get a planner or someone to manage it 
for you. So it's still a self-managed super fund, but you know, you can get someone else to manage it. Obviously, you know, there's a, there's a fee and a cost attached to that. Um, but it just, even if you manage the self-managed super fund itself, you've got to have annual audits, you've got to lodge annual company returns. So the cost can be between three and $5,000 just to run the fund without any other costs on top. Um, so you've really got to have a fund of between, you know, three hundred and fifty and five hundred thousand dollars to be able to give you enough return to be able to make that back that money. It's funny because I know my mum, who's done very well, she's put everything away and she took took it out of the a general super fund, and oh no, she had a self managed super fund and she's putting it into one and she just she couldn't believe the amount of fees compared. So she went back to managing it herself because she just, but she was ready to kind of really take it on and watch it and kind yeah. of get the time. Yeah. And, you know. well, well, and I'm happy, you know, I'm always happy to be open and transparent and share and share my, because I speak and talk a lot from my own personal experience, but um, I personally, you know, I have enough money in my super to justify self-managed super fund, but I personally don't. Um, because I don't have the time, so I trust my planner to do it. So I've just left it in a normal, normal yeah. super fund. But it, it's a very high growth area. Self-managed super funds can have some tax benefits, mm. um, but it's got to be first and foremost seen as super. Um, and, um, yeah, I choose not to do it because I just don't have the time, so I, I leave it and let my, let my planner do it. And it is very tender. I've had a self-managed super fund and... Um, it is hard because it's so accessible <laughs> and you have to be really careful. And I made lots of money from it, but I had to be really careful because it was too there, you know. And one of the main advantages of super is it's a very tax effective environment. Mm. Uh, but if you don't manage it in the right way, you can actually blow that tax effective status and then you're in real trouble. Then they'll cost you a lot of money to, sort it out yeah and it comes i think 50 percent in the dollar or something it's just um, yeah tax is very very high fantastic so okay that was the super one so what is your next tip because we had a bit of a list here one um i think one of them was around the separating which i love separating your business and finance um which is you know you and what's unique about what you do and what you offer which i love um, so I think, yeah, it's really critical that, you know, as we spoke earlier, not to think of business as one thing and finance as another and say, oh, yeah, I can run the business and I, or, or my own personal life and I don't need to know about finance. Um, I think you've got to see them as integral and because my experience, broad experience, I, I do see them as integrated. I um, mean, any business plan needs to have, you know, proper foundation, um, you know, whether it's for you personally or for your business, you've got to have a proper foundation in place and proper arrangements in place um, because without the proper arrangements, you haven't got the foundations right. And without a good foundation, you can't have a good, strong house on top. It's funny, it's that whole thing of, because I know when I've started my business and it's like I get so excited with the creative and... I hadn't, I kind of, I have enough business mind to know where I can see the money coming in, but I don't know what is, what are some of the traps you think that small businesses fall into or individuals, I don't know, just starting something more small business that they come into. What, what have you seen? I think I'm trying to take on too many things too quickly. Um, you know, some, everyone wants to do everything quickly, but sometimes things just take time and hard grind and hard work. Um, making sure you've got, um, you know, cash flow coming in because you're not going to have profitability initially. Um, but that's why, it, particularly in those initial growth stages, cash flow is even more critical yeah, than yeah. At other stages of the business because, you know, that's, that's the lifeblood of the business. So without that, you can't do anything. And particularly, particularly early on when you're building relationships with, with your suppliers and all that as well, you don't want to be falling behind and paying their bills um, and getting a bad reputation because you know, your suppliers will be critical to you. Do uh, banks still do business loans for uh, small business so you can reach out and get an overdraft? I suppose you how long since I've done that, but do they still offer that? Is that something small business do? Or? 
No, no, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's a surprisingly, and I've spoken on this before, but there's surprisingly over 120 banks in Australia. So people shouldn't just think that there's only four banks. I know sometimes it seems like that, but there's over 120 other banks in Australia as well and some really great safe options. And because of Australia's regulatory framework, they're all really well run. Yeah, awesome. I, I just saw a question pop up on screen. Oh, yeah about um, property, property really shares. Powerful. Interesting, investing in property or shares, thoughts. Yeah, um, it, it all goes back to, um, I personally have, have some of both. I think having a spread of investments is a very good idea across different types of investments. But it all comes back to your risk tolerance and you know because prop shares are a lot riskier generally than property um, you've you know you've got to be prepared to trade them look at them um, manage them you know goes back a bit to the discussion about self-managed super um, um, so you've got to be prepared to do your research or buy research on the various shares um, uh, and but and property um, Australians have in particular have a love affair with property Australia's Australians own property more than most other countries in the world although with our property values, that's, that's diminishing. But, um, um, but even with property, you know, buying markets that you know. Um, yeah. And again, you know, I've heard of people, you know, oh, should I go and buy property in Brisbane? Well, if you know Brisbane well, absolutely go for it. But if you know nothing about Brisbane um, and you're being offered a flight up there to fly up for a weekend and, you know, talk to a property developer about buying a property, Probably not. Um, I mean, I've got property in different states, but I've lived in different states, but I don't own property in any state that I haven't lived in, so I don't know the market well and I don't know what I'm doing. It's funny because my mother, who's made, done very well with property she's bought and sold, and she always said you have to buy something that you'd be willing to live in and that you like. Yep. Exactly the same as do you know it. Yeah. And it all comes back to location, location, location. Location by a bad place in a good street or no, old house in a good street. Yeah, the worst house in the best street, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was one of the... Look, we do actually have another couple of questions here. Um, there's two. So it's getting down to basics. Do you keep a monthly budget and how do you track your cash flow? And, yeah, any tips for tracking cash flow? No, I absolutely um, have, I have a monthly budget that I update um, in December each year. So it's part of my kind of new year routines. And this is for, for me personally. Um, and um, so every, every month I know, you know, what my capacity to um, do other bits and pieces is in my discretionary spending, what, what I can and can't do. Um, so I'm absolutely guided by that. One thing that is making uh, budgeting, I think, quite difficult you know, back in the back in the day, you know, we all went to ATMs and had cash in our wallets, and you know that was a, a kind of a mini form of budgeting because you you knew you took out your cash for the week and you know, you could see how much was left in your wallet. And tap and go is wonderful, and Australians embraced embraced it more than any other country in the world. But it does become difficult to keep track of your spending. Um, a lot of millennials now are actually only doing tap and go on debit card; they're not actually doing it on credit card so it's a better way of keeping wow. um, track of their spending but also now with um, technology there's lots of tools being developed um, for people to, with tap and go to be able to keep track of track of their spending so oh. there's lots of budgeting tools out there um, and the banks are actually bringing stuff out as well which is making it easy um, to track because you know it, it's linked into your internet banking so it's picking up the feed directly from the bank Oh, that's good. So, so there new developments coming out on that every, every week. So it's a very active space. Is there anything that, uh, like if I was doing my, my cash flow, which I haven't done recently, but if I was, you know, I have been doing it with a wonderful mentor who's been helping me, amazing, I have a couple of great mentors, um, is that what is it, is there anything that I should be looking out for, we should all look out for when we're looking at it? Is there a percentage that should be higher? Is there something that... Is there a balance or some sort of formula or anything around um, 
what you should be earning or, or having put aside a percentage contingency or is there anything else that you, you would do? see there's stuff that you probably do and you don't even realize that you're doing it <laughs> do you know what I mean like that natural knowing so, yeah look it's always good to to have a, a level of buffer um, you know because there will be be bad days um, I mean the thing that I find is you know the things that are absolutely fixed are generally your expenses um, you know, particularly when you have property and other things, you know, you know what your expenses associated with, with those are or, or your rent or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and then your income can be what's variable um, on top. So um, knowing forward for the year what you're going to have, whether it's a business or personal, um, you know, what your expenses are, because that's the minimum you need to earn. And then the over above that, that's what creates the capacity to have that discretionary money. So that's the difference between, well, do I go up for a holiday to the Central Coast or can I afford to go to Hawaii this year? It's such a hard thing because for people who get wages, um, you can see it. it's coming in, you can go out. But for people, and for, I've been freelance and consulting or run my own business, which I've never, I realise my big thing is I've been running like a freelancer, project-based not a business space. That was a big differentiation that I've just come to through some guided um, insights. And um, that's what's hard when you don't know, you know, what's happening. How do you, and I know that also another mentor has said that, you know, to be really having sales ready for the next 12 months, you should really have your leads coming yep. in. Relevant. Oh, no, you've absolutely got it. In, when you're in business, you've got to have a pipeline of, of business. Yeah. And, I mean, you've got to... Um, assume that only, um, you know, depending on the industry, but only 50% of what you think might happen will happen um, and convert in, into business. So really kind of cut it back, but yeah, be managing, managing your pipeline. And even if it's just a simple form, um, keeping, keeping track of it. The other, another tip for personal, and I've just done this as well. I've, I found a lot of my insurances uh, were falling due in um, December. So I had a big, lumpy lot of payments um, coming due in, in December. And I thought, well, that's just crazy. Um, and so a, a few of my policies, I was able to um, just for a few months pay them monthly. Just, and only so I could spread it out yeah. uh, to align a bit more with, with my cash flow. And uh, just spread spread it out and even it out a bit more. And I, and um, these days, a lot of the insurance companies don't charge you anything extra for paying by the month. Um, yeah, so, I so exactly for that reason. Yeah. yeah. So so I pay a lot of mine annually, but I've now spread them out a bit more, so that they don't all come in one yeah. hit. But there's lots of you know ways that you can smooth your cash flow as well. So not everything kind of hits in one month because that yeah. can be really hard. That's a good point. I love it. Um, now, another question. What scares you most about 218 in relation to finances? I think uh, just the amount of... Well, it scares me and excites me, just the amount of change and things that are happening um, in, in the industry. There's lots of new entrants um, uh, joining the market. There's lots of, you know, with um, fintech and technology, things are changing every day uh, you know you now wake up of a morning and you know four months ago you wouldn't have had a price on the morning news of you know what's the value of bitcoin today um, but now it's regularly reported on a lot of the, the newscasts um, i you know i am concerned about people investing in cryptocurrency it's it is a high risk strategy well, because um, you know we were talking about that. What was interesting, I think, the discussion. Because just so you know, who's listening is that I've joined a platform called Steemit, which is about what they've done is developed a social platform that your blog posts actually convert to money if you're up, you're upvoted. So you, it is like having a bank in a social platform, and then it's also linked to now DTube. So it's another form of YouTube, but you're being paid directly into your crypto account, steam it, which can be then paid out into Bitcoin or something else. And so eventually, and what we were talking about today was that that is going to be your credit rating is in fact going to be online as your part of your profile. So, and you were saying today also that's also happening a little bit already with um, employees or bank, bank things, checking credit ratings. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, everything, as we said, is changing. And for now, for credit ratings and which is your ability to get loans and that kind of thing, whether you're business or personally, um, you know, banks are starting to access social media activity and using it as predictors for whether you're going to be able to um, repay a loan or not, even more than um, your um, activity. We're also moving to something called positive credit reporting. So rather than all the bad things being re just reported, you know, when you do good things, that that's reported as well. So it evens up evens up the balance um, a bit. But, you know, we basically have no privacy anymore. Um, <laughs> everything that we do tells people about us. And increasingly, I find that, you know, people don't ask you what your name is anymore. They ask you, well, what's your web email address or what's your mobile number? And you, you don't feel, feel like a real person anymore. Um, <laughs> You know, you just feel like the tentacles of all, you land everywhere in the digital world. But we'll be inadvertently giving things away about ourselves in the on-world environment that we don't even know that, that you're giving yeah. away. And people are drawing conclusions about you and your ability to do, do things or not do them. I mean, I've, I've, you know, recruiters are now using social media to vet candidates, both LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, and I've heard of a number of people that have been uh, not given jobs because they've been untruthful um, about what's in their resume or what they have or haven't done. And, you know, the recruiters have found that out through social media channels. See, it is amazing. I mean, as you know, I do personal branding with people and their online, you know, persona and profile is just has to be authentic and it's a place to enrich. So that's where people can really kind of showcase their attributes as opposed to hiding stuff. And I think that'll just become clearer and clearer as we go on. Yeah. Um, there's another question. So here we have any thoughts about joint assets, thinking security for women and level of diligence women should have with things that they're signing, for example. So look, I um, don't have an issue with joint assets. I don't see any reason why you, know, you should shy shy away from those mm. um, but it comes back to what we said earlier about engage and and understand um, and know what your family's finances and assets are um, on the signing of documents you know uh, banks are now required to make sure that when someone is signing a document they understand what they are signing um, and you know as a banker you're meant to you know and you know, ask questions to ensure the person understands what they're signing. Um, so make your own questions and diligence and you know, make sure you understand what you're signing. I've seen many examples, I've heard many examples of um, people signing away increases in mortgages or um, mortgaging unmortgaged assets for, for a risky project that they mm. didn't understand that they, that they were signing. So never sign anything unless you're happy with it and you understand what it is and have it explained to you and keep asking questions until you're happy happy what it is and if if you're really in doubt um it's never a problem to take the documents away and seek your own in, independent legal advice doesn't need to be expensive um to do that but it's better to be safe than sorry oh wow i totally agree there's um horror stories I've heard, but I think it is the thing is that you just have to get the right, you have to have it covered legally. But but know what the family's assets are. Don't just say, oh yes, my my partner looks after all of that on our behalf and I just I don't even really know what our assets and liabilities are. Do you know I just want to break into something that's a little bit slightly different, but talking about wills. Um, I was just talking to someone. That's a whole extra. I could talk I for know, anybody. that's a huge thing. But um, oh, before we get on to Will's then, is there any other tip that you'd like? We've kind of covered everything. Um, oh, the keeping update with trends. That was the really, I think, it's important to know what's happening. Yeah, yeah, there's so much happening. And there's, you know, there's new risks coming out with, um, you know, cyber security, things increasingly getting hacked. So just being aware when you're online, um, just being aware of what's happening and what the potential for things to go wrong are. Like you, you laughed earlier in the day when we caught up and uh, I had the little cover on my camera on my laptop I know. Um, because I, I attended a cybersecurity conference last year, which uh, was mind-blowing, really interesting. Um, but people can actually hack 
not to not to overly scare people, but you know, if you're doing your internet banking online, um, you know, people can hack into the camera on your devices and um, you know uh, get information about you in they, in, that, in that way. Did they say though Mac? Because I've always been told Macs are pretty unbreakable or uncrackable compared to others. Did they differentiate that at the? Conference? They didn't, and I and I think it's safer to take an opportunity. You know, better to be. Um, more conservative than not and just assume anything can be hacked. I mean, everyone said, you know, the new technology, which is going to revolutionise a lot of finances, blockchain um, is you know, uncorruptible and hack-proof. But there's early reports that it's recently been hacked, unvalidated at this point, but there have been some stories about blockchain. The un unbreakable being being broken. So. And also we touched on, which is a whole other conversation, but about the uh, new Amazon um, Alexa, who is your, Go you know, like the Google Siri thing, but it's in your yeah. phone and they can listen to everything. I heard one review where the guy said, when he asked it, are you recording me, Alexa? It shut down. <laughs> so it's like threw it against the wall. Very scary, you know. But that's what can happen with the camera on your devices as well. If someone hacks in and takes control of your camera, if you had your computer on at home, they could be what they can be watching whatever you're doing. It's very scary, isn't it? Um, well, let's just. But it shouldn't be. It's like it, you know, yeah. we shouldn't shy away from technology. It's just um, about being aware and using it. Yes. Smartly, not. Yeah. But you shouldn't get scared of it and shy away from it because we need it. But we do need it. Be, be smart. That finances you know don't shy away keep on top of it yep make friends with money don't be the emu and bury your head in <laughs> so tell us big in australia days on friday that's an apt quote oh, yes very good very clever i love that uh very quickly about wills um i just had a friend uh, actually has just got into doing uh wills and he was telling me some scary stuff like that even your neighbor can a contest a will and so now he's developed this thing where you have to really do a proper foolproof trust it takes a few thousand dollars but to actually do it it's it's uh he scared me i can't remember what he was saying but he's going it's really anyone it's a, te it's a testamentary trust yes oh, yeah that, yeah, so yeah what do you think i mean is it as is that true is it becoming oh look i'm not sure well, we're, we're becoming more American and a more of a litigious society than Australia used to be. That That's um, definite. Um, I, I think it comes down to, you know, I, I believe in keeping things simple unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, it comes down to, a, in a lot of cases, the level of assets that, that you have um, mm. and that you're trying to protect. Um, but I think it's definitely critical that you have a will because if you don't have a will, um, the state legislation of where you live kicks in and, and says how your assets will be divided, which mightn't be according to how you would like to see it see it done. And you know, also, particularly if you're in the throes of a marriage breakup or something like that, um, you know, those arrangements mightn't be finalised. Um, yeah. But you might want to change how your assets are distributed because you you, you, know, you are separated. So legally, you're still married, but you know, you'd want to distribute your assets in a, in a different way. But I think there's something even more important than wills, which doesn't get a lot of uh, airplay, and it's um, powers of attorney. So even worse than dying is, you know, if you get dementia, and we know dementia is increasing in our society, and you're not in a position to be able to make either medical or financial decisions in your own on your own behalf, having those powers of attorney in place as so someone else that you trust that knows a bit, little bit about your finances or, or what your wishes are um, health-wise that could step in and make those decisions as you would make them is really, really critical. I um, had a very sad situation recently where my um, ex-father-in-law I uh, had a stroke and, you know, we'd been on his back about making powers of attorney and he didn't. Um, so it's been a nightmare for the family and took about six months to be able to get proper arrangements in place so the family could take control of the finances. And with, in the absence of that, he needed to go into a nursing home and he had to stay in hospital because we couldn't get the money from his accounts to be able to pay the bond to put him in a nursing home. 
Wow. So it, it had a real impact, whereas if he'd had a power of attorney in place, the next day you know, we could have taken that down to the bank, taken control of the account straight away and um, you know, had him in the nursing home, whereas we ended up having to you know, go through a whole process with the courts to prove his incapacity to be able to then get the um, court to award power of attorney to the children. So you can have more than one power of attorney? Yeah. yeah, no, it's up to you how you want to structure it. I mean, it can be problematic to have more than one because if you have two and they don't agree, you've still got a bit of a problem. So probably always good to have an uneven number. <laughs> there's, always a, there's always a ruling vote. So yeah, yeah, powers yeah. of attorney, I think one is okay. I mean, I'm, I just accepted a power of attorney. A girlfriend of mine's gone offshore to work. And yeah. she wanted someone um, in Australia to handle her affairs here in her absence. So I accepted that power of attorney um, on her behalf. So mm -hmm. there's lots of different circumstances that it can be quite, quite useful. Fantastic advice. I love it. And what is so great is um, you are now going to be doing your blog, which is really sharing all your wonderful wealth of information that I'm sure is locked in there. You don't even realise you have it. So, so that's something that we will definitely put out and let people know when that's ready to go. And yeah, and in the meantime, you're going to be just getting out there doing some different talks and, and um, being on the board. Is there any other activities you've got coming up? Or? Um, yeah, and always happy to. So my board activity uh, only is taking about half of the time that I have uh, at the moment. I, I love that and it keeps me current and interested. But I also do love um, coaching, mentoring, um, yeah. giving advice to people. So more than happy to do um, any of that. I know I know a little about a lot of stuff. You do. It's amazing stuff. So in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll put your LinkedIn um url below and then when the website happens, i'll let everyone know and then you can book online to have a session with julie as well to do consulting or mentoring um, would be fantastic well thank you so much great thank great you that, as thank always. you to all our attendees for listening in and we'll see you next week and uh, have a great night thanks julie thank have you. a great night everyone bye bye